Hi, everyone. So uh, I need everyone to do me a favor and stand up. Stand up, please. Now sit down. Because not everyone stood up. All right, stand up. Sit down. Let's try it again. Stand up. All right, now sit in. I want, I want you to sit in like, who, who knows Downton Abbey? I want you to sit like you're on Downton Abbey. Back up straight. Sit down. Back up straight. And I want you to breathe in as hot, as deep as you can go. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, and hold it. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, hold it. And I want you to let it halfway out. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, all the way, hold it. Let it halfway out. One more time. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, hold it. All the way out. Now, I want you to turn to someone that you don't know and say hi right now. Go. All right, everybody shut up. I'm talking. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, my personal story with keto and how it helped me with depression. Uh, first of all, I want to say that depression is a big deal. It's serious and should never be taken lightly. So uh, this isn't a, a lighthearted topic, although I will cover it in my own special way. Uh, but the reason I wanted you to turn to someone and say hi is because the the, the profundity of human connection cannot be overstated. So reaching out to someone close to you, someone next to you, and I mean in proximity, is an important aspect of human creation. So, um, so I want to make sure that you guys understand that you're connected to each other. All right. First things first, I didn't know I was depressed. I spent a lot of time being angry and sad, and I figured that was just the normal way to be. And I had a good job, I have a great family, I had good friends, but my outlook was terrible. I spent a lot of time just hating everything. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to leave the house. I didn't want to do anything. And it didn't really occur to me that that was necessarily a problem, but I knew there had to be a better way. I woke up one morning and I thought, does everyone act like this? Because the people that I interact with, they don't seem like that. And the shows that I watch, are they all that fictitious that they're, they're actually enjoying life? Surely not everyone feels like that. So there was a turning point. I was overweight. I was sad, sick, and tired. And I remember uh, one morning I got up at uh, 3.30 a.m. because I had to drive for about two hours to get to work. And I was in the middle of a dark living room and I had to put my shoes on. And I remember leaning over as I was sitting there to put my shoe on, and I could not breathe. I was so round, I couldn't comfortably lean over to tie my shoes. And I thought, oh, this is not good. This is not good, because I need my shoes, <laughs> clearly. Uh, but I was also full of excuses about things. It's not my fault. It's everything else. It's this. It's that. Why is the world against me? This always happens. Blah, blah, blah. But I realized that there, my only option was to do something about it, but I didn't know what to do. Did you know that there's no instruction manual for your life? What's great about books and TV shows is you know the hero is going to make the right decision, or you know the hero is going to pull through, unless it's a George R.R. R. Martin novel, and then you have no idea. That's a Game of Thrones thing. Never mind. Anyway, so... There's no instruction manual for life, so you have to kind of make things up as you go, on the fly. Now, I stumbled into keto because of my son's epilepsy. Had it, not been, had it not been for the fact that my son was diagnosed with epilepsy, I would not have gone full bore into keto. My son was diagnosed with epilepsy in 2009. The neurologist put him on several different combinations of medications, some of which he responded to, some of which he did not. The last meeting that I had with the neurologist, she half-heartedly, off-handed said something like, if that doesn't work, we can try the ketogenic diet. Now, I had spent years in the gym lifting weights, lifting weights and getting fat, yes, it's a thing, look into it. And I had heard about the ketogenic diet, but I had heard it from the context of you don't want to do it long term, it's only to cut body fat for competition. 
Um, if anyone remembers Robert Sykes, boy, were they wrong. So I'd heard about the ketogenic diet, so I knew a little bit about what she was talking about, and she described it as, it's a modified Atkins. So I went home and I looked into it a little bit. And I said to my son, Noah, because that's his name, hey, we should try keto. And he said, oh, heck no. I like uh, sugar and spice and everything nice. And I said, well, I really think we should try it. And he said, are you kidding me? It's not sustainable. You cannot do this. Now, he's, at the time, he was 9 or 10 years old. And he's telling me keto is not sustainable. Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay. When you are given an option by a medical professional that all you have to do is change your, diet, your, your child's diet and they, they have the possibility of being cured or the possibility of leading a normal life, would you fight tooth and nail to implement that or would you let it pass? You fight tooth and nail. So I decided I was going to show my son that it was possible to sustain a ketogenic diet. Because I said, if I can do it, because I am a sugar addict, anyone can do it. And he said, have fun, I'll eat your Little Debbie snack cakes. <laughs> True story, he ate my Little Debbie snack cakes. So I started the ketogenic diet. Now I did it to show my son that it was possible to live that way. Boy, did I not know what I was in for. Two days after I started, I woke up and I did not hate everything. It was at that point that I realized, okay, there's, this is, there's something serious here. So I made a decision. All right, I'm going to keep doing this. I stuck with it, and I decided that I was going to track my progress on small victories. And it started with, and I kid you not, one small cup of coffee. Now, for me, a small cup of coffee is about yay big. So uh, I had the first uh, coffee with coconut oil, butter, and I put an egg in mine, a whole egg, but not, uh, not the shell. Come on, let's be honest. Get real. So I put an egg in mine as well, blend it up, drink it. And for anyone who can, who can attest to this, and I've had hundreds of people say it's the same thing, there is a sense of euphoria that goes along that, with that when you get that rush of ketogenic food, especially in the very beginning. And that's what I experienced, and I thought, okay, this is what I'm chasing. This is what I want. I want to continue this because I turned to my wife and I was like, is this normal? Is this what everyone else feels like? And she was like, yeah, this is normal. So you should be more like that. And I was like, I'm going to try to be more like that. So I embraced the fat. And I put fat on everything and I ate fat everywhere. And I added fat to everything. Now, uh, we've had uh, a speaker uh, talk about the variety of fat as being very, very important. Uh, Alison Gannett said, and I... And I I echo that wholeheartedly. Not a single just kind of fat, but a multitude, variety of kinds of fats. Animal fats, monounsaturated fats. In different quantities, in different proportions. Mix and match, whatever. But it's important that you get the fat in. And then I read everything. I read the blogs, and I listened to podcasts, and then I read nutrition labels, and I realized, holy crap, my entire pantry is full of foods I can't eat. And I stood there, and I was like, but I like that so much. And then I threw it away. And I made a list of non-negotiables. A non-negotiable is something you don't even debate. My primary, my primary number one non-negotiable was bread. It's non-negotiable. Done. End of story. Not going to have it anymore. Why? Because I friggin' love bread. I'm not going to have it anymore. That was my non-negotiable. The other one was sugar. Not going to have it. Period. That means you had to throw away ketchup. Because ketchup's basically a vehicle for sugar. And I love me some ketchup. So down the rabbit hole I go, and I'm throwing out all these foods. So uh, the results after doing that, sticking with it, making the decision, continuing on and on, making the decision every day. I lost 70 pounds. I didn't mean to. I didn't want to. I didn't care. Like I, my concern, was, there's a reason why you don't see a lot of before and after pictures of me. One, you see this, it ain't photogenic. Two, I wasn't concerned about my weight, so I, don't, I didn't really care about the before. If you could take a before and, pi before and after picture of the thoughts in my head, first of all, you wouldn't want to see the before ones, and second of all, I think there's really a lot of pretty colors in the after ones. So there's, no, there's not a lot of before and after for me because it was all up here. I also slept better, which is a, 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 a um, multiplier for feeling better. I'm not up 
feeling bloated and sick and my stomach is gross and my brain is just going all kinds of crazy, I slept solid and I slept great and I could actually put my head on the pillow and the next thing I know, it's time to wake up. Has anybody ever experienced a night where you put your head on the pillow and like 37 hours later, you're still laying there? At least that's what it feels like. And then you get up and you go in the living room and you watch TV and then like another 37 hours, like, oh, I got to get up. This, that was not this. I'd hit my head on the pillow, boom. And then I'm up and I'm rested. My confidence improved tremendously. My son, who said, you can't do that. You cannot sustain keto. My son looked at me and goes, um, you're looking pretty good. I want to try that. And I'm like, that's right. That's right you do. Go make me a sandwich. No bread. And I had a lot of energy. A lot, a lot of energy. I was able to do things that I wasn't wanting to do before just because I was, I, I didn't want to just lay down. Has anyone in here ever experienced the kind of depression that I'm discussing or that I'm talking about where all you want to do is just crawl up in bed and not get out at all? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Totally up to you, but that's what I was up against. So can you imagine the difference of my outlook when all of a sudden I wanted to not just get out of bed, I wanted to bound out of bed and get to stuff and do stuff. So guess what I did? I started a website and a podcast and Facebook groups and a conference in Austin to have a bunch of people come learn about keto. So. And then I thought at that time, this can't be real. This can't be how everyday people feel. Because holy crap, how can people feel this way when the world is still such a disaster? Like if everyone should feel this way, everyone's going to be like, seriously, like hippie paradise, love and peace and rainbows and ponies. I don't think everyone feels this way though, because hangry is a thing. All right, so why did this work? The question that I wanted to find out is why did that work? And this is a, this is a controversial area. I freely admit it. And you know what's the benefit of not being a doctor or a PhD or someone who's like reputable? <laughs> I can come up with any kind of theory I want and no one cares. So these are my theories. I'm going to say that uh, there are a couple of reasons why uh, the change in my diet had a profound impact on my mental well-being. And I have a follow-up theory that I'm, uh, I have a working hypothesis that I'm totally willing to go uh, uh, go to the mat for, and I am uh, totally uh, uh, incapable of sustaining it, but I'm going to make it with complete and utter confidence, because I am not a professional. I'm just a nobody, and that helps. So, three reasons. Brain fuel, anti-inflammation, and insulin. Those are the three primary reasons why I started to feel better. That's the three, those are the three primary reasons why someone starts to feel better mentally when they switch to keto. Brain fuel. Keto, uh, ketones prevent cell injury. Neurons get damaged. Now, it used to be thought that when you damage a neuron, that's it, you're done, it doesn't grow back. That's not true. Neurogenesis is a thing. Ketones allow for a, a more profound growth of neural cells. Ketones uh, also kickstart neural mitochondrial activity. And as uh, Dr. Bickman wonderfully explained, your mitochondrial activity is seminal and, and important for all of the activity that you've got. It's, without it, you don't grow new cells. Ketones inhibit reactive oxygen species. Now, what I want you to think about whenever someone says reactive oxygen species, now raise your hand if someone says that and you're like, I don't want to say anything, but I have no idea what that means. Right, me either. It's rust. Think of it as rust. Would your brain operate best if it's full of rust? The answer is the answer is, yeah. hey, thank you. All right, so ketones allow for lower amounts of rust in your brain. Think of it that way. When Dr. Brickman talk, talked about it being a cleaner fuel, that's exactly what he was talking about. Uh, oh, sorry, I went one too. Um, they also dem demonstrate a similar property to some neurostabilizing drugs. And this is my theory. This is my working hypothesis. There is a, I'll say, um, tentative, just to be on the safe side. I'll say tentative connection correlation between epilepsy and depression because the same drugs treat both. There is a connection there in my working hypothesis that I've, I've talked to a couple of um, psychiatrists about this and they were intrigued by it. They didn't call me an idiot right off the bat. 
is that depression is a symptomatic form of epilepsy. It is cyclical, as is as are seizure activities, and it demonstrate or it's demonstrated through uh, certain brain activities. We could test it, yes, but that's my theory that epilepsy and depression are essentially the same thing. One is a more prolonged uh, a series that would be the d the depression piece of it, and epilepsy is a more um, uh, a more uh, sudden and profound uh, version of the same kind of brain activity. All right, so. How, in, uh, how does keto, in, uh, keto uh, help with inflammation? It reduces NL, NLRP3. That is an inflammasome. Now, if I were to say to you that's an inflammasome, what would you think the first part of that word would indicate? Ugh, what? There you go, inflammation. In, in, NLRP3 is the largest inflammasome in the human genome. And beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone, inhibits that. It reduces that. So that NLRP3 is reduced tremendously, so therefore inflammation is reduced infl uh, tremendously. By the way, inflammation, we toss it around a lot, but nobody really explains what it is. It's your body's immune system attacking itself. When chronic inflammation happens, it's your body's immune system attacking your, your, your body. We want acute inflammation. We want that. We do not want chronic inflammation. You guys see the difference. Acute inflammation, I break my ankle or I twist my ankle and it swells up. That's protecting the joint, that's protecting the tissue, that's helping to heal. We want that inflammation. What we don't want is systemic inflammation throughout our entire system, which is our, our immune system attacking our, uh, our internal systems. So, as we also said, keto reduces uh, uh, the rust inside of different parts of the cells. <clears throat> now, the problems with insulin is it is the master hormone regulator. Uh, it helps with a hormonal cascade. It's responsible for many things, including energy partitioning, but this is a quote from uh, Dr. E, Dr. George E. Every time your insulin goes up or down, all of these hormones, which are uh, aldosterone, uh, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, and adrenaline, just to name a few, every single time it goes up and down, each one of those have a correlating event. So when you spike your insulin, all of those other cascading hormones are going up and down all of the time. You ever feel weird after you eat something? You ever feel angry after you eat something? You ever feel sad after you eat something? And here's the thing, we've, give, we've become so detached from how food actually impacts us because we're so concerned about looking at macros that we have eliminated that aspect of why we're eating what we're eating. If you pay attention, I kid you not, try this. I, I challenge you all to try this. Keep a food diary, not to track your macros, but to track how you feel after you eat a specific kind of meal. Because I can promise you, certain things are gonna make you feel sad. And certain things are gonna make you feel elated. And certain things are gonna make you feel like you gotta go to the bathroom really fast. <laughs> so every time you spike, you, you spike your insulin, you're spiking all these other hormones, right? And you cannot control that. Now, when you mess with your insulin levels, all these things go up and down, these downstream hormones, they get out of whack, and there's no way you can maintain your well-being with all of this activity going on. Now, insulin is also responsible for energy partitioning, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. In, uh, insulin shuttles energy in and out of cells, and it also keeps energy stuffed into cells. By the way, those are basically fat cells. It says, hey, you got this. We're, we got energy out here. You, you stay fat. Without insulin, you're going to starve to death from the inside. However, your brain does not need insulin for energy. Now, it has insulin receptors on your brain cells, but they are not there to shuttle energy in and out. You with me? So, insulin does impact your brain cells, but not for energy, okay? Now, if the, one of the primary functions of, ins, of insulin is energy partitioning, and your brain does not need insulin for energy, then your brain doesn't need to be bombarded with insulin. You guys with me? You following my, you tracking my logic? Okay, so, uh, so insulin, resistant, then insulin resistance then becomes a problem. Now, think of it this way, the cells are the kids in Charlie Brown, and insulin are the adults in Charlie Brown. And insulin's going wah, 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 and the cells are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Not a single thing. Because they're stopped responding. Those insulin receptors on the, on the walls of the cells are, have stopped responding. Because they've become numb to it. 
So what is your body's signaling resp uh, reactions when the cells are not responding to insulin? Because the cells are signaling, I don't have energy. I need energy. And if insulin is an energy partitioning hormone, what does your body then do? It goes, hey, pancreas, get off your duff. Start making insulin. And the pancreas is like, well, I was, but I'll make some more. And then the cells are like, still not listening. See this downward spiral? That's insulin resistance. Muscle cells, fat cells, brain cells. They all are impacted in that way. Because insulin still impacts your brain. Remember what I said before, it has insulin receptors, but not for energy. Insulin demonstrates central neuromodularity functions such as um, uh, learning and memory. It's been shown in studies that higher levels of insulin can impact negatively memory and learning capacity. This insulin spike is affecting your brain on a fundamental level, not in a good way. So when you keep your insulin levels down low, you are allowing your brain to learn, you are allowing your brain to calm down, you are allowing your brain to burn clean. Uh, abnormal insulin, insulin, uh, insulin signaling, it, is res it can culminate in, in synaptic failure. If you let it prolong, you end up with stuff like Alzheimer's. There's a reason why the Alzheimer's is, is being called type 3 diabetes. The insulin resistance is going to kill your brain. If, you, if it continues. Uh, so if your muscle and fat cells are insulin resistant, your body will continue to pump insulin, and that increases the insulin damage done to your brain cells. So what you eat impacts your food. So going keto helped resolve my depression because I, didn't, I wasn't inflamed, I dropped my insulin, and it allowed my brain space to breathe. Remember that breathing exercise we did before? Not only did it calm you down, but that's the illustration. When you can only let out half that breath, that's because your brain's surrounded by insulin. When that insulin's gone, you can relax. And life is easy. Okay, any questions? Yes, I have one question in the front row from a, yo a lovely young lady, and I'm going to assume her name is Beth. So, Dad? Yes? What's for dinner? <laughs> I think we're having meat for dinner. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Are there... Are there any other questions? Would you guys, anybody else want to talk about my brain health? Because I know I do. Uh-oh. The Incredible Hulk is running at me. I, I have a question. Yes. You are electric. <laughs> That's not a question. You are electric? <laughs> That's all. Thank That's you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, how is your son? Say again? How is your son? Oh, that's a great question. Noah, who is my son, will, has started his sophomore year of college. Uh, he went seizure-free for two years after starting keto. Um, he had three small seizures last year. He has been seizure-free for another year right now. And we're working with, uh, we're trying to adjust his medication to accommodate his keto because keto has profound impacts on neurological medication as well. So when we start him on that, we have to then start to figure out levels of medication as well. I would like to try to take him off. His neurologist would like to take him off, but it's not at a point because he's in the middle of school, so we can't do that just yet. So our, we're hoping and we're, we're working through that, but he's doing very, very well. Um, the, the incident, not to tug at your heartstrings a little bit, but the incident that led us to, to, the, to the neurologist where she talked about uh, the, the ketogenic diet, uh, my son went to the bathroom, went to, into his bathroom and locked the door and he was by himself and we heard him fall. And my wife and I are so tuned. Anybody have a child with epilepsy? You become almost daredevil-like, the, the, the uh, comic book character. Your senses heighten. I know where my son is at all times in the house. And I know because I'm waiting for a crash all the time. And we heard a crash from the bathroom, and the door was locked. And my wife and I are freaking out because we have to get to my son because I don't know if he's fallen and hurt himself, he's bleeding, whatever. We get the door open, and he's on the floor, and he's having a seizure. And if you've ever experienced the feeling of holding your child while you think that your child is dying, it will move you to a point where you cannot possibly come back from. 
And it was at that point that I realized that there's got to be a better way for him. That's why I was so adamant about trying this to help him. That's why I was so determined to do it, because I never want to experience that again. So he's doing very well. Thank you for asking. The breakthrough or where he had three, do you think he had varied from his diet? Or? Say, oh, no, it, no. We monitored it very closely. Okay. And that's, we were, were on him all the time. Exactly. When he, whenever he had a seizure with the, breakthrough th the, with the breakthrough seizure, that was the first thing. What did you eat? What did you eat? What did you eat? And he's like, I don't. When he was okay. first uh, medicated, he was you know, this big. And he lasted until he was this big. So obviously that's going to have an impact. So we just have to adjust. Thank, Thank you for that you. question. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I also have a history of depression, and um, after starting keto about nine months ago, it, it didn't really fix my depression, but I did gain the clarity to realize that I needed additional help. Yes. And so I actually have since started an SSRI. Do you know of any impact that taking an SSRI has on keto or vice versa? That's a good question. I've been asking that question. What I, what I have not been able to get is a definitive answer. What I get from certain people who are like uh, keto is, oh yeah, you don't want to do that. And what I get from other people is, that's a great question. We should look into that. I, I, what I have not found is any evidence that there is any problem. All right. Thank you. I'll say that. Next question, please. Hi, Ryan. Hello. So, a lot of people when depressed tend to turn sometimes to cigarettes and Illegal substances, yes. we'll call them. Yes. Do you know the effect of those, um, well, it's actually a two-part question, legal substances and, I suppose, smoking on keto? Oh, illegal um, uh, narcotics and smoking on keto? Well, clearly they're not going to be good for you, right? <laughs> um, so there, there's nothing about keto that prevents the del deleterious effects of those things. So let me, let me just say that. Hmm. I will say this, though. It's in, it's, it has a corollary to what you're saying. Anytime someone reaches out to an addictive behavior, smoking, drugs, alcohol. This is my theory, okay? Remember, I don't have to su substantiate my theories because I don't have any medical training. This is my theory. They are seeking desperately for connection with something in the world. That goes hand in hand with depression. They are the same thing. My, 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 the reason I say that is because it's not enough just to change your diet. You've got to have human interaction. You've got to have another human being there that you can anchor to. This is why we start support groups. This is why we have local areas that we can get together and, and talk to people. This is why it's important to have accountability partners and those kinds of things. Now, to answer your question specifically about chemicals, about how those things impact keto, they're not good. Obviously, you don't want them. It, it, they're going to be, there's nothing about keto that's going to prevent the narcotics from having the deleterious effects on the, 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 the body chemistry. And there's nothing that's going to prevent your lungs from being affected by the carcinogens that you're inhaling. Unless I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, just another part to that question as, as well. Um, during depression, do you think that keto actually gave you some sort of significance as well? I found oh, yes. a lot of people found that. Yeah, uh, yes, and I will, I will say this to the day I die. Keto is my mission. This is, why, this is why this happened. This is why I do everything that I do. Um, I, have, I have assembled a tremendously, uh, I, I, I can't even describe the words of how profoundly blessed and grateful I am for the team that I've put together, for the people who are here. This is why I do everything. Keto is my mission. If it wasn't for that, I, I, I would not only be floundering, I would probably be miserable and uh, just, I would be existing. If, if that. So that's an excellent point. Having that as a, as a fundamental anchor point in your life, I think is tremendous. I've talked to at least 10 people in this conference in the past two days who have said exactly the same thing. I got to keto. I felt great. I want to do something. Do it. If you feel like, do it. Start it, whatever it is. I don't care. Do it. And yes, there's absolute purpose and meaning in that. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question. Ryan, I just need to thank you for Keto Evangelist, for this conference, for everything. Before I found Keto, I had an idea that there was something that could help. Right. And then I found Keto Evangelist, and then I got Keto right. <laughs> and it has made an absolute fundamental difference. I'm so glad. In my life, and thank you so much. I'm so glad to, to hear, uh, this is why we do what we do. This is, this is why we do what we do. This is why Jimmy does what Jimmy does. 
This is the fundamental difference that we're trying to make. Thank you all, thank you all very much, not just for uh, enduring my presentation, but also for being here. Thank you so much for uh, investing in this, giving us your time, being here, the camaraderie. Thank you so much. Thank you.